All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Um, if you miss anything that I say, I will be putting this whole thing on, uh, on YouTube afterwards. So um, that's why I'm mic'd, although you can't hear it. Uh, so uh, getting, into, um, getting into grad school, um, what do I know about this topic? So I've been on the grad admissions committee in nanoengineering and chemical engineering. It's the same admissions committee uh, for six years. And I've been the chair of the admissions committee for the last two years. Now, every department at every university works in a different way. So I'll try to highlight some areas where, uh, where I think that, that there will be differences, but there will be a lot of similarities uh, as well. So uh, my goal in this talk is to help you get into grad school, um, but don't take my statements um, of what I believe is the case uh, as an endorsement of, uh, of the status quo. So there's, there, there are some sensitive topics here like the importance of GRE, the importance of GPA, undergrad research, and, uh, and so forth. I'm gonna tell you what I think the median response will be of an admissions committee looking at a particular uh, application. The first thing to consider is why do you want to go to grad school in the first place? Uh, and I'll be talking mostly about PhD programs. Um, MS programs are a little bit more algorithmic in the ways that you, uh, that you approach them. Uh, they tend to be more GPA and letter based, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily research based, whereas PhD admissions committees definitely look for, uh, for research uh, experience. So just one sentence about, uh, about MS degrees. Uh, it's highly recommended in most fields, uh, but you don't necessarily have to do your MS right after undergrad. Oftentimes you'll go to a company that might pay for you to do uh, the MS on your nights uh, and weekends. Okay, what is a PhD? I don't think a PhD is synonymous with, uh, with expert. Uh, what an expert or what a PhD says about somebody is in an ideal case that they are like a Jedi master in creating knowledge. So like a, like a black belt in a martial art, a PhD should have skills that are widely transferable, but that have this, uh, but, but what, they, what they actually did was learn how to use the scientific method to do research to create uh, new knowledge. Uh, I would advise you not to go to grad school just because you've always been a student and you always think that you know, you're kind of may, might be afraid to step into the real world. And I say that from experience as somebody who's never been in the real world. I've only ever been in academic uh, environments. Um, uh, and, uh, and grad students don't get paid much. So this is something that not everybody knows, uh, but in comparison to the big three professional schools, so med school, law school, business school, those all cost money. PhD school doesn't cost money and you get paid to do it, albeit not very much. Uh, and you work uh, long hours. The, the joke is um, while there is some flexibility, uh, you get to work any 70 hours a week that you want. <laughs> uh, now, depending on the field and depending on the, on the lab and what you hope to get out of your PhD, uh, it may not be uh, 70 hours a week, but it is generally considered to be more work than a full-time job, although there is a lot of checking email and coffee breaks and so on. And generally, uh, people that I know that have gone to grad school have found it to be fun. You make some of the strongest friendships you're ever gonna have because you're really um, in the trenches, as they say, with these people like doing, doing work late into the night and, uh, and, and, it, and it can be uh, quite rewarding. If you decide to go this route, you'll be spending, um, for most people, much of their 20s in grad school. Um, and at the end, you may be overqualified for many jobs. So it is totally possible to educate yourself out of the workforce. 
because there will be a lot of jobs that actually won't consider you once you have the PhD because they will think that it's, uh, that it's below your skill level and that you're just gonna get the job and be unhappy. And they might be right. Uh, the job that you will eventually get, because it is harder to get a job with a PhD, although it's easier to get the jobs that you want, uh, if you love research to get the PhD, but it is definitely not something that I recommend everybody do for all of these reasons. If you want a career in academia, you absolutely must have the PhD. It sort of goes without saying. Only go to grad school if you love research. If it's just something like, I don't know what the next thing I want to do with my life is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that as a cue to, um, uh, to, to go to grad school because you don't get paid a lot, like 25, K, 25 to 30K, although tuition is paid for usually by, uh, by your program. Depending on how rich your lab is, how many grants your, uh, your principal investigator, or PI or professor, advisor, all the same, the same thing has, um, you might have to do a lot of teaching. You might have to be a TA uh, often. Usually the PhD program will require some amount of, of TA ship to help put you through uh, the program. Um, but for example, in my program, that's only one quarter. You only have to teach one quarter. Where I was a grad student in my program, we had to do two semesters. So that was two full, uh, so that was a full year of, uh, of teaching. Okay, how does a graduate admissions committee work? And I'm gonna be speaking mostly about my department at UCSD, but this is, these are, these are broadly uh, applicable ideas. So there might be three to six professors plus the administrator in charge of the graduate program. So what we do is on the day, a few days after the application deadline, uh, or, or maybe, maybe even the day of the application deadline, we, take, we see all the applications some schools a triage. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the word triage, but it's kind of a um, uh, word in the in the emerg in the, the the medical community where they have too many injured people uh, than they can deal with all at once. So they say, well, this person has the most critical injury, so we'll do something uh, with them. And it has a very cynical. Uh, meaning in grants and uh, in the world of, 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 of academic peer review, where if an application doesn't, they don't believe it has a chance, they'll triage it and probably not consider it further. Um, there's no hard cutoff uh, in my program, for example, for GPA, but it is not uncommon to see this at something around 3.0. It's more common to have a, G a GPA cutoff for MS programs than it is for PhD programs. The opposite of triaging is kind of prioritization. So you can, uh, uh, applications can be prioritized on, upon certain factors. For example, if you have uh, an undergraduate publication or posters or some documented research experience, then, it's, then your application tends to get prioritized. Oftentimes in a graduate school application, you'll have a space to write uh, names of faculty that you would want to work for, work with if you went to that program. And oftentimes the, the recruiting is done on the basis of who you put down on that list. So your applications will, will be funneled directly to those particular professors and they will be the ones to judge your qualifications because presumably you've applied uh, to their lab. Diversity of, uh, of gender, um, race, socioeconomic status, undergraduate major uh, can, be, uh, can be a fairly large or small factor in admissions uh, decisions, uh, depending on, um, well, kind of, frankly, regardless of the legality of, uh, of one way or the other, uh, that, uh, that um, uh, diversity is uh, regarded as a good thing. I believe it's a good thing, um, but it is not uh, treated uh, with the same 
uh, with the same priority uh, with every program and every department. In general, committees will try to take a holistic approach uh, to do the evaluation, so they won't just consider GPA or GRE or letters or research experience. They'll try to look at the whole uh, application or personal statement. But space is really limited. Uh, there's, there are awesome applicants, like applicants that have what I would consider to be a near flawless application who get rejected from the top uh, programs. And it's important not to take rejection personally, no matter, I could have a slide that had this written a hundred times on it, but you'll, you're always going to take it personally. I always take it personally when I get a grant rejected or a paper rejected. Uh, that's just human. Also, I got rejected from MIT for grad school and I'll never forgive them. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, that's how it goes. Um, Maybe someone reading your application didn't have lunch yet. So this is uh, kind of what the system looks like from the faculty perspective. So I have redacted basically all of the information from this, uh, this application. Uh, but um, this is, so I log on here and I can flip through uh, the, the applications. Then some nuts and bolts tells you if you paid your application fee. This is another reason uh, maybe that that's kind of like a barrier at the beginning. Applications are usually like $100 to apply to a place. Um, and, you know, uh, I, guess, <laughs> I guess there's a good reason for doing that. It's not a ton of money, but it's a lot of money for, it, for an undergrad senior for sure. Um, especially if you apply to 10 places, that's $1,000. But it's often possible, it's very often possible to get the application fee waived if you have some special circumstances. So uh, you don't have to fill out a full FAFSA form or whatever to get an application fee waived. Usually it's a lot simpler uh, than that. And we tend to do that for, for a large fraction of applications. Okay, and then uh, what, what major, like chemical engineering, electrical engineering, whatever, what, what is their degree aim, PhD, and so on. Uh, then we ask uh, about residency, uh, federal, ethnicity, um, whether or not you are a, uh, a veteran, and this is all in the, the service of, of, um, of uh, having, a, uh, having a diverse class entering class. Um, secondary education, so where did you go to high school? Where did you go to, uh, to, a uni to university? Um, what dates did you attend? Uh, then this is uh, academic performance. So cumulative GPA, sometimes uh, you have the option of entering your last two years GPA because maybe you did a little bit too much partying freshman and sophomore year and the GPA from the last two years you think is more representative. So then at any point we can click on view or download and then in the window, the, um, for example, the transcript here would just pop up and we can flip through it, make sure that they copied the information over and, uh, and just see uh, that everything's right there. These are in progress courses. So, they, so you typically apply to grad school in the, uh, in the fall of your senior year. So you'll, be, you'll still be, um, You'll be in classes and we just sort of want proof that you're actually still in school. This is the uh, probably the most controversial aspect of the uh, of the graduate school application and that's the GRE and we ask most places ask the applicant to fill this out um, and then as kind of a redundancy and just to make sure that they entered the right numbers we have the educational testing service send the GRE scores uh, to us. Then in the nanoengineering department, uh, which is also also administers the chemical engineering program at UCSD, you put uh, you fill in the box for the names, so the professors that you would want to work with if you uh, if you end up going to that place. This is important. Other documents, if you want to enter any published papers, conference proceedings, or posters, or whatever you may have, I would recommend combining all of those into a single PDF and uploading. Uh, everything. If there's no box like this, but you have a you have a paper that you want the committee to see, um, I would actually forward that. I would email that to the graduate administrator in that department. 
um, because it's really important that, that they see evidence of, uh, of documented research experience. In our department, we have a focus area. It's also true in other departments, um, you know, wireless, whatever uh, might, might be the uh, circuits, whatever might be the case. Um, letters of recommendation. So letters of recommendation, when a recommender gets a form, sometimes there are some criteria by which you rank the, or by which you score the candidates. So that could be, um, uh, well, for example, academic and intellectual ability, potential for success, communication skills, and so on. And then you give them a score, in this case, out of 4.0. I've just eliminated all the biometric data. These are all histograms that end somewhere in the redacted portion. And those are the averages. So then, uh, then one, this is the, the dashboard for one particular recommender. Uh, so what is their title, department, phone number? Do they waive access to the, recommend, to the recommendation? Most people, um, most people um, do. Uh, mo most people don't allow or, or would prefer that the student not see what they, what they wrote. Um, and then again, this is where the individual uh, faculty recommenders or industry recommenders fill out uh, this information. Statement of purpose, CV, so we just click on these and we can see them, then letter of exception, financial support, documents, external links, whatever. Uh, sometimes there are parts of the application that require long responses that are not included in the, um, in the personal statement. So we ask for evidence of leadership, um, overcoming adversity, and these are really ways to, uh, to describe yourself as a human being in a way that's not going to be reflected in a number. This thing really goes on forever, doesn't it? Um, so uh, more stuff here. Where did you get your bachelor's degree? Have you um, received third party sponsorship? We really want to know that because if, uh, if you're a free student, um, it may increase your stock a little bit. Uh, what have you been doing in the last six months if you've not been in school? Um, graduate preparation programs like NSF run some programs and, and so on that are useful. How did you hear about us? <laughs> uh, list other places to which you applied. And then this is where our ratings of the candidate are, uh, are entered. Okay, uh, now various parts of the application, the GPA. So for better or worse, the single most important thing you can do to increase your chances of getting into the grad school of your choice is to maintain a high GPA. How high is high? 3.5. It doesn't mean you need a 3.5, but it helps. Having a high GPA doesn't make you the smartest person in the applicant pool. It implies you're smart, but more importantly, it indicates without ambiguity that you know how to manage your time. So the GPA is kind of a reflection of um, understanding of the material combined with how well you manage your time. Um, because if you have a million extracurriculars that might look good in well-roundedness and so on, but it might detract from your, uh, from your GPA. High GPAs generally don't happen by accident. There are just too many courses and getting A's in every single course by accident is really hard to do. Uh, it is of course possible to be a great candidate for a PhD but have a low undergraduate GPA. I know lots of, uh, lots of individuals to which this applied um, because the GPA uh, doesn't explain things like, uh, like tenacity and perseverance and the ability to work with others uh, and so on. But since there will be hundreds of applications in the pool and you have four, you have really three years uh, or four years, depending on if you're on the, a five or four year or five year trajectory um, as an undergraduate uh, to get this, this part of the application right. And, and you know that some people in the pool will have high GPAs. So you wanna make sure that you look good um, and don't give up points, so to speak, uh, unduly. 
the, uh, the GRE. Uh, so the, the GRE um, is given, in my opinion, way too much weight. Of course, I would say that having not a particularly GRE, good GRE score myself. Uh, it's a little bit like the uh, Grown Ups SAT. The verbal is harder, but the math is easier. But other than that, it's very similar to the SAT. Uh, there are GRE subject tests. There aren't subject tests in generally in engineering, but there are subject tests in physics, chemistry, so on. It, it, depending on what field you go into, there may or may not be a subject test. And that could be a way to get out of the, um, the paradigm of the GRE as like a, some test of native ability or, or whatever. So the GRE in all forms of testing uh, designed to measure native ability is really controversial. Uh, GRE scores are known to be correlated with socioeconomic class, but they don't reflect things like perseverance, ability to work in teams, um, uh, emotional intelligence. I would argue that they also, um, they also filter out smart people that have issues with concentration, and I would fall into that category. So, uh, so my, my verbal uh, my verbal and uh, analytical writing portions were in the 90, 90 plus percentile. My quantitative score was below 80th percentile, actually below 70th percentile, but I'm not going to tell you how much below the 70th percentile because <laughs> it's going to be really embarrassing. But my, uh, my quantitative, so I did my undergrad in, in chemistry and physics and my chemistry minor in physics, my chemistry GRE subject test was in the 90s. Uh, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the verbal and the writing were in the 90s, so they, they kind of overlooked the math section, maybe. Uh, not MIT, obviously. <laughs> uh, some, some programs no longer request the GRE. The NSF uh, GRFP, the NSF Fellowship, no longer requires the GRE. Actually, they haven't required it for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, but again, also with GPA, uh, it's really hard to be lucky and get 99th percentile on the, on the GRE. So I think it's possible to be a genius and do poorly, um, obviously, obviously. <laughs> but it's hard to get a top score by accident. Uh, because you will still have to take this um, uh, cortisol-inducing monstrosity of a waste of time test, here are some tips. Uh, remember to study your really basic math. There will not be a single derivative or integral on the whole thing. There is no linear algebra. There's nothing hard um, because you're competing with people that, that are getting PhDs in, uh, in uh, history and English as well. Um, remember to comp how to compare quantities, um, basic facts about right triangles, and so forth. So if you forgot the rules about 13, 14, 15 ratio right triangles, now is the time to remember all that useless nonsense. And uh, get a study book for this. You don't want to give away points on the GRE. For the verbal, I tend to look uh, with favor on people who do well on the verbal section, in part because scientists and engineers generally don't do that well on the verbal. And if they do well, it means that there might be something, uh, something special about them. Um, there used to be a book uh, back when I took the GRE in 2004 uh, that was called Word Smart for the GRE. Um, it was a great little pocket book uh, that's, that had a, a list at the end that was the GRE Hit Parade. And I'm sure there are lists like this in other books or online that gave you the, uh, the, the words that occurred most frequently in the last three to five years or so on the, on, the, uh, on the GRE. So the point there is get some three by five cards, cut them all in, into halves, uh, and write down the, the words on the word on one, half, one side and the definition on the other for the words, for the vocabulary words that you don't know uh, and then as you know them, put them in another pile, and then when you're walking to class or on the bus or whatever, um, go through them uh, until you learn them all, because they will show up. And then 10 years later, when you come up with the word uh, itinerant, 
which I would never know except that I, measure, that I memorized it 14 years ago. It means that you follow like an itinerary and you travel, you travel a lot. That's what it means. Uh, so 14 years later, you can impress people at cocktail parties with useless facts about 13, 14, 15 right triangles and uh, word smart for the GRE. There's a writing section as well, and thankfully they let you do this on a keyboard. So unlike an AP exam, you don't have to scribble it all out by hand. Unless on AP exams you actually type the answers now. No, it's still, okay, still all longhand. Those poor graders. Um, so you can actually type the response to the GRE. Uh, make sure you get a book for this as well and learn concepts like uh, determining the difference between causation and correlation, analyzing an argument, and write a long response. Don't stop writing. Uh, use punctuation and write in easy to understand sentences, but it's about the detail and the argument that you put in the paper. Don't, don't just say, this is what I think about the passage. No one cares. Just write the, the um, uh, use, use the five or so key arguments that are in a good GRE prep book and say they're confusing correlation and causation. And here's why. <laughs> undergraduate research is really important. So, uh, so undergraduate research documented in the form of papers and posters. This, I would say, after GPA is the second most important thing you can do to get into the PhD program of your choice. If you don't have any undergraduate research at all, uh, there's no way that you would probably even apply to a PhD program because you don't know what research is like. <laughs> so, um, so in order to, to know, uh, in order to apply to the PhD program, of course you wanna know what research is actually like. Okay, so having a paper as an undergrad so beyond like a poster presentation, if you actually get your name on a paper, this can mask a lot of shortcomings in say, uh, in, in like GPA or GRE. Uh, get your advisor to write you a letter. Uh, make sure that they say what you did in the lab. Um, send the paper into the committee. I said this already, so send this to the graduate administrator to attach to your file if there's not a part of the application that will accept it. Um, posters and uh, presentations are almost as good as papers, but you need more of them to have the same effect. I don't know what the ratio is, two posters per paper or something. See if you can go to undergraduate research conferences and maybe even like a professional conference might even have a, uh, a section only for undergrads and that's a really good place to go. So this is a question I get a lot. Should I join one undergrad, uh, one research lab as an undergrad, or should I skip around and kind of see what a lot of, what, what a lot of them are like? I have a, uh, my opinion is to not skip around too much. And the reason is because it's easier to get a paper if you're there for like the whole summer and the whole following year and so on. Um, it's better to get summer if you like your lab and you're flourishing in it. If you're not, if the grad student or postdoc you're working with is a slave driver, then you probably don't wanna stay there anyway, or the, uh, or the advisor is not, gonna, is not supporting you, doesn't really, doesn't really, is not really invested in your future, then go ahead and switch, uh, and switch labs. But you, if you're in a good position, you're better off trying to seek um, uh, summer funding as opposed to getting an REU elsewhere. That's my strong uh, opinion on the topic. It does make it harder to see diverse perspectives because you're only seeing the way that one lab works. Uh, so that's a disadvantage. Um, but again, if you're in an unsupportive environment, definitely go elsewhere. Research for PhD programs, not for industry. For PhD programs, Research is better than an internship because the work is easier to document in the form of papers and posters and other types of, of uh, presentations. Um, and the admissions committee are made up, is made up of professors that might know the person who wrote your letter. Speaking of letters, 
you will need three uh, excellent letters. You'll need at least one excellent letter. Two is better than one, and three is better than two. Uh, you want to find people who are really invested in your future, people who, uh, who want to go to bat for you. The more detailed, that is, the longer the letter is, with more information that only the letter writer would know, like this person was in my class and they asked questions, they came to office hours, they were always on top of their, uh, their homework and they did well on the exams, uh, the better. Start building relationships with your recommenders early. Go to office hours, avail yourself of the dine with a prof or coffee with a prof uh, program. Uh, if you don't know the professor, uh, be prepared to provide a range of information ahead of time. Also prepare for them not to respond to you. So if they, if they don't know who you are at all, uh, it's totally possible they'll just let your email go to the bottom of their inbox, never to be recovered uh, again. You may be asked to write, to supply a significant amount of information for the letter. Now, students in my own lab, I'll write the entire thing because I know, because uh, I know them. When students ask who are in a class, and just to give you an idea, I get about 30 requests per year. And when I send those out to grad schools, they go to five to 10 schools per year. So it's not, so I would say that I probably end up submitting about 200 letters uh, per year. That's, uh, that's about right. Um, so, so if I don't know the student, I need a lot of help. And it's not because I'm lazy, and it's not because I don't care about, about, about you. It's, is, it's that the letter will be better. The letter may be like three sentences if I write it on my own, but it could be a whole page if I get, uh, if I get help with it. Chances are, at the end, because I've done this hundreds of times, um, the text that I'm given, even when I ask for help writing the letter, uh, the text that I'm given will not be what I end up submitting but the, the content will be there, but it will be in my writing, in my, my tone. Also, uh, this is just a, forgive me, this is just a little like professor's pet peeve. A lot of times when the, when the, um, when the evaluation form comes up from University of Michigan or wherever it might be, and my name is not filled out, my phone number is not filled out, I have to enter all that stuff in one at, like, one at a time, a hundred times, or 200 times each fall, <laughs> and I don't wanna do that. So please go easy on your, uh, on your recommenders and fill in as much of that contact information and all of that stuff as possible. And consider getting a gift for your recommenders afterwards. Uh, personal statements. This is an important part of the puzzle. Sad truth is that although you spend hours and hours and days on them, very few of them, even for the successful candidates, will be read all the way through. Maybe the people who really want, uh, want you in their lab, uh, they will read them all through, but the committee is probably not going to read every letter or every personal statement from every application. So you want to make it eye-catching. Um, don't start out the way that everyone starts out, which is, ever since I was a kid, I loved science. Because that's 90% of personal statements. Um, and uh, there are other kind of trite ways of starting, like I stared up into the sky, and I saw the stars and I wondered about how the stars got there. And, um, that's, let the students at UCLA do that. <laughs> Let's not be the ones that do that. It's, uh, it's a little pedestrian. Um, if you've overcome obstacles to get where you are, everybody's overcome obstacles. Some people have overcome some really significant ob obstacles make sure that you take the, take the time to explain them in the personal statement. If you have what you consider to be a weakness in the application, maybe your GPA is not as high, maybe it's because 
you had an illness one of your years of undergrad and you weren't able to keep up with the work and your GPA suffered um, as a result of it, the personal statement is a good opportunity to, um, uh, to explain it. In, the, in this personal statement, mention your faculty preferences by name. So this is another way that it might get routed to the right, uh, to the right person. Some departments, and this is uh, some departments that I've recommended to students to really recently, um, they had uh, 3.9 GPAs, awesome G GRE scores, and they got rejected, and publications and, and awesome letters, but they got rejected um, because, probably because the, the faculty that they had listed weren't accepting students that year, and they just weren't accepted to the program at all. So make sure that you reach out to the faculty ahead of time, um, or you could have you could ask your advisor to reach out to a faculty member ahead of time. Um, and in some places, not all places, but in a minority of places, your application basically has no chance, no matter how good everything else uh, is. If the person that you're applying to doesn't know you're applying to them, or if they know, even if they know and they don't have money, uh, in which case they might tell you, then you might not be admitted to the program. Have, have several nice friends review your personal statement, but they shouldn't be too nice. Once you believe it's perfect, send it to your advisor. And if your advisor is doing their job, they'll show you how perfect it is. <laughs> uh, fellowships, NSF and NDSEG. So the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program, um, lots of people apply to it, about 10,000 apl applicants per year, about 1,000 get it. The application is due in November. You can apply once as, a, as an undergraduate and once as a grad student. So this has changed in recent years. It used to be that you could apply three times. And when you review it on the other, on the other side, uh, so I've done reviewing for the NSF GRFP program, basically uh, a month before this uh, teleconference, we get 25 or so applications and we, we, we rate them all on a score of one to 50. And then we can, then we, we write some comments about the, uh, about the, the applicant and their, their, uh, their potential to flourish in a competitive program. Then, the, since as a rater, I might use the score, the, the range from only 40 to 50, and my colleague at UCLA might use the rank of 1 to 50, their people aren't going to do as well as mine. So the NSF normalizes all the raters <laughs> so that everyone gets the same normalized, is ba based on the same normalized score, uh, which eliminates much of the, uh, the inconsistencies in rating, but not necessarily all of them. And then uh, what, are, what happens is that those scores that get that are low scores, let's say like an average of 35 or, or lower, those are triaged, which is a euphemism for rejected. And then what happens is that the remaining ones, if they're, if they're, very, if they're very high scores, they get discussed by the, uh, by the professors who reviewed those applications. And scores that have disparate uh, numbers, like they had a 50 from one person and a 15 from another person and maybe a 30 from another person. Those three people discuss that applicant to try to or not equalize the scores. Um, it might be that you have an advocate that liked something in your uh, pro research proposal that said, look, this person really knows what they're doing um, uh, or this person overcame a lot of adversity uh, even though you know, they, they have one poster and this other person uh, who went to some top five school has five papers, but of course, someone who's working in a giant lab at a top five school might get you know, a, few, a few papers. So it was like easier for them than it was for this other student. So they try to uh, evaluate the applicants uh, holistically. 
Uh, this is part of the rule that you can't have more than one year of graduate education in any field before August of the year you apply. Um, so uh, I try to figure out what that means, <laughs> uh, but basically if you are a, that, that means that most second years are still, uh, still eligible to apply. Exceptions are usually made for five-year BSMS students because there is usually a five-year BSMS program at most, uh, most programs in most universities. For the NSF, the GRE is not required at all. The GPA must, uh, uh, I, I, would, I would change that, not must. Uh, if it's people who don't score so well in the, in the GPA category can have other um, compensating uh, aspects. Uh, but, you, but everyone must show commitment to outreach, diversity, broader impacts more generally. Like um, how are you going to, how is this investment of, of 50K per year in your graduate education on the part of the federal government going to increase um, access to education more, uh, more broadly. NDSEG is similar, but a bit more meritocratic. Um, and there are also many fewer awards made. So it's about 10, the NDSEG stands for National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship. Um, if your lab that you're doing undergrad research in is funded by one of the Department of Defense agencies, like the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the uh, uh, Army Research Office or Office of Navy Research, um, your advisor um, might mention to their program officer that they have a student applying to the award. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly not, uh, not going to get you the award, but it, but it could uh, perhaps grease the wheels a little bit. GRE is required for the NDSEG. Again, it's a little bit more meritocratic than the NSF less emphasis on broader impact. So basically how it works for NDSEG is the, this is my understanding, I don't know this for sure, but uh, anecdotally this is, appears how it, how it seems to be, that the uh, program managers in the various defense department um, uh, agencies have the first sort of round of selection, then it goes to the American Society of Engineering Education who makes the final decisions. With that, that's all I have prepared, but I have some time for questions uh, as well. So thanks for your attention.